here. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, today's land use committee meeting for September 11th, 2024 is in session. Uh, I'll ask everybody to go around and introduce themselves. I'm Jay Rose Pepe, uh, City Council. Eric Warden. Mm -hmm. oh, Eric Warden, City Council. Scott Diener, Council Member 3. Rob Patonsu, Mayor. Nick Bond, Community Development Director. And is somebody else on from the planning department? I see Jim Fisk is here, but I'll, he can stay on mute. Okay, that's fine. All right, uh, we have an agenda. Uh, are there any additional items uh, to be added to the agenda? Uh, Eric, at uh, one point you had asked to ask about a uh, home demolition, but we had a discussion last night. I didn't know if your questions were answered. Yeah, we, we uh, covered it last night. Okay. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. I would like to add an item uh, for just to uh, ask uh, Nick to, if you don't mind, <clears throat> Nick, uh, to uh, elaborate a little bit more on discussion about the ADU. Uh, if we have a couple of minutes, just uh, to let the land use committee know what's going on with that. Sure. Uh, interesting project. So uh, first item up is comprehensive plan uh, periodic update. I know we're coming down to crunch time. So go ahead, Nick. Yeah, so um, we included two items in the packet today. Um, the first of which, um, I, I believe at our last meeting, we encouraged you to take a look at the capital facilities element that was online. It is a document that is in flux in terms of the projects that are included in our six-year uh CIPs, as well as the funding amounts and the timing of when uh, the funding for each project is needed. Uh, we we sent the land use committee, we sent the packet out a week, uh, a week or so ago, and um, this is actually an older version of the capital facilities element than what was shared with the finance committee last night. We've actually stripped the dollar amounts out of the, the draft because we're in the middle of budget and things are changing uh, fast enough that my head is spinning a little bit. And so I will go plug those numbers back into the document once I have um, better numbers. But I, I did want to just um, see if you had any questions since last month about the, the chapter um, and um, I, I believe we've already talked about it as land use committee, correct? We, we've kind of went through the land use element or I'm yes. sorry, the yeah. capital facilities element. So are there any uh, significant updates because of the financial side? No, there's no significant updates. Um, if you look at the tables, all of the project names that are in the document are still intended to be, to carry forward in the final plan. Um, but the funding and the timing of when each of these things is going to occur is still a little bit up in the air as we kind of work out the 2025-26 uh, budget. And that will remain up in the air until until the budget is is uh, moving towards adoption, hopefully in November or early December. Um, and so we will we will shift things out if they don't make it into this year's biennial budget. And we will add anything that's in this year's biennial budget to the list. Um, if, if some other project is uh, emerges through the budget process. And I can give you a brief update on, on the budget process. Noah and I have met with uh, only two of the dire five directors at this, to this point on budgets. So we're a ways out. Dennis has gone at a conference this week and we're not. Dennis is the most impact to the catapult facilities element uh, coming from public works and our our one on one with Dennis um, to review his proposed budget um, to fold it into the mayor's budget is until the twenty third. So we're you know a week and a half out before we even have preliminary numbers and and then then of course it has to be a balanced budget. So and whether or not there's enough uh, resources to do all the things we desire to do. All right. Eric Smith. All right, Scott so the second, do. oh, go ahead. No, I didn't know Scott had any questions. Okay, go ahead then, Nick. So the second part of what was provided in the packet for um, the comprehensive plan update is that uh, we we included the rough draft of the Bethel Sedgwick and Bethel Lund sub area plans. And um, we had on, uh, at the end of July, we had a public workshop. We had a hosted at the library because of city hall uh, council chambers construction. And we actually had really good turnout from the neighborhood. Um, and so in the packet, we've included the engagement summary, just a summary of the feedback that we received from both, both the in-person event, as well as our online outreach. 
generally, um, there was more interest in uh, changing regulations and changing standards in the Bethel Sedgwick area, more so than the Bethel Lund area. And so um, I, I think, though, you know, it, it you have to take that with a grain of salt because there were a handful of very vocal people who showed up. And we I mean, getting participation in these areas has always been a challenge. And while we had quite a few people show up, um, I, I don't think it's anywhere close to a majority of the the sub areas, but we did take uh, the feedback. And I think the preferred alternatives that are now um, that we have released on our website and are currently out for public comment, we are generally um, proposing a few more zoning changes and more areas of height increases in the Bethel Sedgwick area compared to the Bethel Lund area. In the Bethel Lund area, we are um, we're actually most of the residences in Bethel Lund are kind of northeast of where the Puerto Vallarta restaurant is located. And so we've intentionally kept heights at three stories in that area um, out of you know respect for the public feedback that we did receive. We did propose increasing heights um, on the east side of Bethel and south of Lund. And while I don't expect us to see a lot of tall buildings there, we didn't want to preclude the possibility that, you know, Home Depot is creating a future development pad, whether that ha becomes retail or whether somebody wants to build an office building. I think we need to be open to the possibility that something other than a single story uh, building would be allowed. And so there is a proposed overlay district uh, in each of the sub areas that includes uh, some height increases over the base height, which is typically three stories throughout both of these areas. And so if you go to page um, uh, pages uh, 101 and 102 of, or I'm sorry, 100 and 101 of the packet, you will see the proposed zoning changes and the height overlay map for the Bethel Lund area. And then the, um, the, the Sedgwick Bethel area is a little bit further on in the packet. I can give you the page number, but I'll, I'll share my screen real quick. So this is... Um, Current zoning on the left, proposed zoning on the right. There really aren't a ton of changes. Um, one of the things we are doing is, um, you know, we've had some residential subdivisions in here that probably don't need to be zoned R3 because they're not going to develop with higher density housing types because uh, River, the Riverstone subdivision is all single family and it, the houses haven't even been built yet. Um, maybe they would choose to build a duplex on a few of the lots. And so the um, the proposal here is that this be R2 rather than uh, part R3, which is what it is now. Um, so that's actually being down zoned a little bit to reflect uh, what's happening in that area. The um, uh, We're changing some of the area on the east side of Bethel to commercial heavy. There's a couple of houses here where the Dutch Brothers uh, coffee went, and there were a couple of pieces that were commercial corridor. And so basically this whole east side of Bethel is set up to be kind of an automotive auto oriented commercial area. Um, but the uh, shopping center up where the, the Safeway gas station is, is, is changing from commercial heavy to commercial uh, corridor. And the public, um, the stormwater pond property that we bought next to the Bethel Tavern, this is now city owned. And so we've changed that to public facilities to reflect uh, the, the public facilities designation. And um, the, the, uh, Let's see, I think that's about it. So these proposed zoning maps are out for public comment right now. And um, we're taking public comments, I think through the end of next week. And then we're looking to finalize um, the, the plan with those uh, proposed zoning map changes. And then this is the height overlay district map. Everything in green is remaining three stories. The yellow would allow up to four and the red would allow up to five. And so the four and five story areas that you see here are, um, are a, a one story or a two story increase over the base heights that are allowed in these areas. Uh, the other thing you'll see in the, um, the document is there is a matrix that, um, let me see if I can find it here real quick. Yeah, Nick, I'm on another screen uh, looking at this at the same time. Can you give the page number when you get there? Yeah, the matrix is actually back on page 45. And okay. so um, when we initially outlined the alternatives for the sub areas, we had an alternative one, which was the status quo. Alternative two was compact growth and alternative three was transit oriented development. Right. And from those and based on the feedback we received, we, we basically went through each category and we came up with a preferred alternative, in, in which in most cases is a hybrid 
of two or three of these based on the feedback that was received for the public. So for, um, and you'll see this reflected in the draft comprehensive plan, whether it be for uh, parking standards, we're not actually proposing any parking standard changes compared to the existing code. So that would be uh, choosing alternative one as it relates to parking um, for affordable housing. There's a goal that says if the city council were to bring back the multifamily tax exemption program, consider applying it in this area. Um, the uh, the alternatives two and three were a little bit more aggressive on having MFTE applied in this. Um, there's, par there's a section here on parks. Um, and let me make this a little bigger for you. You're probably having a hard time seeing it if you're looking at the Zoom screen. Um, for parks, uh, we've mostly followed what's in our parks plan and said explore opportunities for parkland in the southwest quadrant. And we described kind of where where parks could possibly be located. And um, so this matrix is really to help the public kind of understand how, how we've looked at the various alternatives and settled on uh, sort of a preferred alternative. So um, our intent is to adopt, uh, so we've done this for both the Bethel Lund and Bethel Sedgwick areas. Our intent is to adopt these sub area plans as part of our 2024 comprehensive plan update. And the reason for that, um, just to jog your memory, is that um, in the countywide planning policies, we have what are called local and countywide centers. And when we apply for transportation funding through KRCC and through PSRC, we get additional points on our grant applications by uh, pursuing projects that serve centers. And in order for something to be a center, it has to have a minimum level of activity and it has to have a plan for accommodating more growth than kind of the baseline surrounding area. And so because these areas, um, we had not previously developed plans for them, we chose to pursue the development of a sub area plan to meet the criteria in the that PSRC and KRCC have provided to us so that we will hopefully be able to get additional grant money to build uh, improvements to Bethel and Salmonberry and Sedgwick Roads uh, in the future by being more competitive than um, applications from our peers that serve areas that are not in centers, if that makes sense. So any questions um, so yeah. far? Yeah, Nick, I have one. You were talking about that the... Uh... The feedback at the library, uh, you know, very people were very spoken. What did you get comparatively online? Anything, um, same amount, very limited? Um, I think I think maybe there were a handful of people that weren't in person that also participated online. Um, I have to go back and look at the. Uh, the report here. This is a big packet. Sorry, I'm I'm scrolling so much. All right. So, I mean, when you look at Bethel Lund, I mean, we have we had 14 total votes in terms of which alternative people preferred. Um, and this is from the online piece. So, right. We we probably had 30 people show up to the workshop in person and. You know, uh, Sedgwick Bethel, we had 33 total votes. So it gives you kind of an idea that maybe we reached a handful of people or maybe there are multiple people per household that are participating. Um, but there there aren't a ton of residents that live in these areas because they are mostly commercial areas. Right. Now, I was just kind of curious, you know, uh, on that, I saw the, the chart and I was wondering kind of if it was, you know, about the same or, you know, a little different looking at this. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think the other thing that happened was our um, the library cut us off at 8 p.m. sharp, and we were a little delayed. One of our consultants was late getting to the uh, the workshop, and so our presentation ran long, and then we had a lot of residents who wanted to ask us questions on the fly that kind of slowed slowed down the presentation process, and we didn't really have as much time to spend in the room with people. I think we maybe had 20 minutes walking around talking to people at our various boards, um, and so we did have some good conversations, but I think a lot of the people who were there, the library sort of flashed the lights at us and told us to get out. And so most of the comments came from the on from the in-person workshop probably came in after the fact online. What time did that start again? Started at six and went till eight o'clock okay. and the library closes at seven. So they had already stayed open an extra hour for us on that that evening. Hmm. Nick, um <clears throat> Do you expect 
buildings to come in that are taller than three stories? Have you heard of? No, I don't. I I, I think that um, I think that the uh, the economic viability of a four story building in Port Orchard it just other than maybe right on the waterfront, it probably right. doesn't pencil in most cases. Um, but we're going to have a real challenge um, right now, it, talking just generally about our comprehensive plan and our buildable lands report. We have exactly as much commercial land as we need for our growth target. As we continue to grow, we are we are getting shorter and shorter on commercial land, and we're going to have to figure out ways to squeeze more jobs into the city uh, in future years. And so I think by providing this height now, we are adding to our land capacity and something that might not be viable today may be viable in the future. And, you know, we had multi-care looking at doing this uh, emergency care facility on Sedgwick. Uh, we had a pre-application meeting with them several weeks ago. And so it, it's very possible that something like that could come into the city and may may choose to go higher than than three stories. Um, but yeah, I, I don't expect that to happen soon. But the fact that we allow it means we've added capacity to the center and we're trying to to direct growth into this area. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. I, I, when I think of Silverdale as an example, which is all commercial, you know, they only have, I think they have like two, one apartment complex and then the medical center, you know, the hospital. So um, I couldn't imagine besides medical, what would come in here that tall, so. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And in some of those, com like the commercial corridor zone does allow for ground floor retail with apartments above. And so um, it's, you know, if the multifamily tax exemption program came back, that would probably make those projects closer uh, to being able to pencil. But I, I still think they don't pencil even with a multifamily tax exemption right now. Um, sorry, do you, maybe I'm way off on this question. Apologize if I am. Um, do you know why we don't draw um, more restaurants, like like corporate restaurants or things like that? I've always been curious um, why Port Orchard doesn't draw doesn't draw that. Maybe, well, maybe the mayor might know. Maybe Rob might know. I don't know. You know, it's interesting. We we met with a developer, um, the the new owners of the South Kitsap Mall. They're they're really interested in attracting that sort of corporate restaurant at Chipotle or you know yeah. something of that sort. And um, everybody that I've talked to in commercial real estate just says this is not a Class A market yet for for those types of retailers. I think one of the thing one of the problems is that our roads um, we we do not have good access to a lot of our properties because we have rural roads in a city. And until we make the improvements to Bethel and Sedgwick, um, I think. Oftentimes, somebody comes in and wants to develop, and we say, "Well, you have access problems, and you're going to have to build all of these improvements before you can open a restaurant." Plus, mm -hmm. we have impact fees that you have to pay, and um, I think in most cases, it's really hard for somebody to to spend that kind of money uh, on on a restaurant. Uh, plus, you know, if they're on over here, you're on West Sound Utilities, but in the city, our connection fees are very high. Usually, if you have a restaurant, you're you're using a lot of water, you're generating a lot of sewage, and so. The, the upfront cost of developing that type of business in Port Orchard is really high. Okay. I, yeah, I think Nick's spot on. I think we're going to see a pizza restaurant, I believe, in the village as one of the restaurants that I've heard of there. Uh, you know, the opportunity I think we see is when the Bethel Quarter gets built out and Home Depot, they've got a couple of really nice pads that very, very well could end up being one of those uh, national brand, uh, you know, restaurants, but until we fix the road, um, Nick's right. It's access and, you know, they generate a, a lot of traffic trips and then in turn, they have to, you know, fix the road and until we got to fix the road for them. I think if we want to attract that. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. And I, I think one of the challenges too, is that with Sedgwick specifically, the roundabouts on Sedgwick are part of our traffic impact fee. And so if a, if a developer comes in and builds the roundabout, they can get a credit for the intersection improvement. They can't get a credit for doing frontage improvements or widening the road in accordance with our plan. We've, we've, our, our policy going back to 2016 was that's a state highway. The state needs to take care of their road. And so um, it, a developer has, has uh, the state tells the developer to fix something. 
uh, we can't give the developer a credit against their impact fees because it's not something that we've agreed to fund as part of our impact fees. So that's something you could consider. We do have a contract right now to uh, complete our um, transportation impact fee study update, which should be done um, by the end of the year or shortly after the, the first of the year. And um, I, I asked the consultant about that. I said, hey, is there any way that we can reduce the burden on commercial a little bit? Because that's going to bring in a lot of sales tax dollars. Um, it seems like like Gravity Coffee, I, I forget how much their uh, impact fee was for opening a little drive through coffee stand, but it seems very high relative to the amount of cars I see in the drive through there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. So I think that's something to pay attention to. Once uh, once we get the traffic impact fee study update, um, you know, think about what it actually means for the commercial businesses, but also understand that if a project isn't on the isn't part of the fee calculation, it's not eligible for a credit if a builder is required to to fix it. Thank so you. so I pulled up. Uh, oh, go ahead. I was saying, Nick, isn't isn't uh, there a, a price point change in construction when you switch from say three stories to four stories by virtue of uh, of using steel instead of stick built? And yeah, I think, and I, I think it's more of the four to five story height difference. I I think the biggest challenge for <laughs> a four story building is that most people aren't going to be on the fourth floor unless they have an elevator. And so uh, I think that asking somebody to to walk up four flights of stairs. Uh, is is not any more expensive to build, but it is harder to rent uh, yeah. a unit on that floor without the cost of the elevator. That's a good point. So on page 155, I've got the same map showing before and after on uh, the Bethel Sedgwick sub area. And I want to point out, you know, we've we've had several subdivisions go in recently. All these houses have been built. Some of these areas are zoned R3. Some of them are R2. We're just proposing to make them R1 because they're all new single family houses. They don't, they're not going to redevelop. So some of the properties in here are actually being down zoned. The, the, uh, we've got a little bit of R1 here that is proposed to go back to R3 to match uh, all the other land that's sort of around it. Um, also going to R3 is um, just north of Andazio Village off of Salmonberry. Um, there's some large lots. It's, you know, there's the possibility that you could have some infill development occur there. And the, the R3 is is a better zoning tool for these lots that have, you know, kind of private driveways or, or other access constraints. Um, it, it might provide a little bit more flexibility. Um, and then you've already seen this at a previous work study, but the property that the, the uh, Port Madison Enterprises has bought is going to commercial heavy from the previous R4 designation because they are likely to develop retail commercial and we have no control over what they do, but we, we wanted our map to at least match what, uh, what, what the tribe's likely to do. And then you'll see a little bit more green on the map. These are the pocket parks that are privately owned by these neighborhood associations. So we're just showing that they are uh, in parks designation rather than available for development. And uh, we also added just a pocket of business professional mixed use. So this is um, on Blueberry Road where the new apartments are going in. Across the street on this corner, you have storage units on half of the block. There's mm -hmm. this little area where we thought, you know, maybe they could do something that included a little bit of retail on this corner that would be like a neighborhood commercial. Somebody could put in a coffee shop or uh, something that would transition from uh, the heavier commercial along Bethel into the neighborhood. Um, so that was one one minor change that you see there. Also, the uh, Les Schwab and the dentist office are going from commercial corridor to commercial heavy and just making everything going east on Sedgwick commercial heavy until you get to the apartments that were uh, recently built. Nick, what is the uh, size of the property that Port Madison bought? My recollection is it's either 60 or 80 acres. Um, okay. 60 is what I heard. Okay. Yeah, but it's not all in the city. Some no, of I understood. City and some of it's in the UGA. Yep. So again, with this sub area, we've also got the height overlay map. And this, the the residents who came and participated in this process were more open to increasing density in this center. And so other than the, the single family neighborhoods, which are unlikely to change anytime soon, everything else is, uh, you know, we wanted to, to buffer some of these areas with um, kind of transitioning from four and then up to five stories. I don't think you're going to see a whole lot of tall development, but we didn't want to preclude it because it, it's a way to add capacity within the sub area, um, at least on paper. And, and 
who knows what the viability is going to look like in 10 years once a lot of the easy to develop land is has been developed in the city. So anyway, I would encourage you all to study the preferred alternative uh, and the, the sub area plans because they will be coming forward to you as part of the package for review uh, as soon as this gets uh, out of the planning commission. And um, you know, ultimately the city council doesn't have to adopt the sub area plans if you don't like them. But the, the reason for doing so is that, that if we apply for a grant to do something on Bethel, we get to check the box that it's in a center and these will cease to be recognized as centers uh, on January 1st, 2025, unless we adopt sub area plans by then. So just to bring it around full circle, by, for lack of better words, increasing some of the density and, and some of the changes, uh, this will make us more competitive uh, in the uh, grant and funding cycle. Yeah, that's correct. And I'll, I'll point out, we um, when the KRCC wrote the center's policies uh, six years ago when we were working on those, we decided that we would create something called a candidate center. And if you were a candidate center, you got immediate recognition as a center, but you had a deadline of, of January 1st, 2025 to get a sub area plan adopted. And so we had to follow through on that with these two centers as part of our, our comprehensive plan update process. And the reason that Chris's application to design the roundabout at Bethel and Lund scored well is because it got points as a center. If he had applied in the 2026 funding cycle, he would have no longer got those points uh, in the absence of us having uh, developed and adopted a plan. That's a great point, Nick. It is definitely a part of our funding strategy for the round, the double lane roundabout at Bethel and Lund. And right. that's because we were able to check the box because we were uh, in this interim stat status, we scored well and we're able to get the, the design dollars. We're going to be going back um, to get construction dollars in, in, a, in, a, in a future cycle. And, and we want to be able to check that box. Otherwise, we likely won't score high enough to get funding. And, and a little background on the center's um... Before I came to Port Orchard, I, I was working in uh, Eatonville and Pierce County, and Pierce County was a few years ahead of Kitsap County on the center's discussion. And so I saw I, I came here having seen the debates about centers in Pierce County and uh, immediately informed the council. I said, hey, centers is a big deal. We need to designate centers in our city. And so our 2016 plan, we, we identified 10 centers around the city um, with an eye on if we if we direct growth to these centers, we will score better in our transportation applications. And so um, we've kind of been ahead of the curve on this all along. I think Bremerton uh, is a regional center, which is a higher category of center that has its own funding source at PSRC, but they only, I think Bremerton only has two other centers. I think the county has two countywide centers. Um, Paulsbo has uh, their downtown in one other area that's a, a countywide center, and then Winslow is a center. But we have centers planned all over Port Orchard, and we do have a lot of land area relative to those other jurisdictions, except for maybe Bainbridge Island. Um, but uh, our we we are going to do very well in grant applications through KRCC because so many of our transportation projects connect to these areas where we are are designating uh, for additional growth. I good think what it, uh, go ahead, Scott. I just said good foresight. I was going to say when this comes up to council, please either one of the committee members or Nick or Mayor, please bring up that you know that uh, something that Eric had said that just because we say you know designate it for five story doesn't even necessarily mean it needs to go. You know, builder has to build that high. It just helps us with the uh, with the cycle, uh, the funding cycle. So it's it's a it's a great move. I think it's it's important to be ready for the market when the market's ready. The market isn't Port Orchard isn't, isn't right for that due to the construction costs. Right. But if we don't have the tool in the toolbox, we may we'll never realize it. Cool. Any other questions on this? Comments. All right, non-conforming use and structures. Um, I, yeah. So I, um, at our last meeting, uh, and and I think we've been talking about this for several months now, but 
Um, Jim and I provided feedback that we had talked to, to um, Charlotte Archer, our city attorney, about not, whether we could allow for some incremental expansion of nonconforming uses. She confirmed what you know Jim and I had had understood was that you know really the best tool for if 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 you want to allow something that the zoning code currently doesn't allow, you either need to rezone the property or change the development regulations rather than a, granting like a one-time expansion of a nonconforming use. And so the land use committee had asked um, uh, Charlie to write up uh, an opinion and provide legal advice uh, concerning that. And so she she did send we did send an email to you from Charlie uh, providing that legal analysis and advice. And she just sort of restated that that her you know her recommendation is that if if an area of the city has nonconforming uses and we want to allow for expansion of that land use, we need to look at zoning changes, not not. Uh, changing the non-conforming use code. Yeah, I think it's, uh, after reading that, I'd say it's uh, both a slippery slope and a rabbit hole if we went down that route. And uh, again, that when there's a a request to rezone, that's when we should probably take a look for it and look through the process. I don't know, Scott and Eric, if you had a chance to read that yet or not. I have not had a chance to read through the memo. As I just got back into town, but um, uh, yeah, I don't know that that asking for a rezone is is the answer because in in that instance you're you're going to be looking at a, a a spot zone and um, while that's not technically illegal as I understand it's it's not good planning either. So now mm -hmm. you're looking at an area wide and that really changes the intent of of what we've garnered over the years with choosing our zones. Yeah, and I, I think for that particular block that we were talking about, you know, it's zoned R4 right now, which is really meant to be only multifamily, and it allows additional height. If you wanted to change that from R4 to R3, you could also change the height overlay district for downtown to, to make it zoned R3, but add the extra story of height. And so the city council members have the ability to um, initiate comprehensive plan amendments, and so the deadline is January 31st. If the if the council wanted to consider making a change to that area, you could you could ask that we consider that as part of the 2025 comprehensive plan annual amendments. And um, I think R3 with an additional height as an area wide change in that part of um, downtown, um, it would it would make the single family houses conforming, um, but also allow up to four story buildings, uh, which is consistent with the current zoning. So that's something that you could initiate as an area wide uh, proposal. When when was the current zoning uh, established? It, so it's actually part of the downtown sub area plan that we did in 2020 or 2019. So okay. it's um, you would be amending the sub area plan and the uh, land use map uh, and zoning map. Downtown, um, when you just mentioned um, raising the height limitations. Is there something in place that protects um, views and whatnot or? How yeah, we have. Um, so in downtown, we have the downtown height overlay district. And then in the residential areas above downtown, we have the view protection overlay district. And so the downtown, uh, I'm going to pull up some maps here and share them with you. But the uh, the downtown height overlay district is um, it sets height limits by the number of stories. And it's mostly in areas that are relatively flat. Um, so this is the, the downtown height overlay district map. And I'm going to try to make this a little bigger for you. Oops. Uh, oh. Where did it go? And Nick, we're talking, I believe this request was outside of the height overlay. Yes, it, it currently is. So I'll, I'll show you that in a second as well. So right now, our downtown height overlay district has a downtown height overlay three four stories, and then a few areas where there's five stories uh, that are allowed. So um, the properties we were talking about are up on the hill here. And if we go back and look at the view protection overlay district, you'll see that, uh, oh, which one is it? VPOD. Um, there isn't a map for the view protection overlay. Oh, there it is. Okay. So, so those properties are in the view protection overlay district, but they still can allow a four-story building, but you measure the buildings differently. And so we allow up to 28 feet for 
an apartment building, if I remember, or 27 feet for um, mixed use shop front. Oh, apartment buildings are actually only 15 feet, but you measure from the average uphill property line. And so when a lot slopes down, you can still get four stories going down the hill, but you can't get four stories from the road going up where it's going to block the person across the street. So, um, you know, I, I think that I, I think that the um, I, I guess you wouldn't even need to amend the height overlay necessarily. You would just need to change it from R4 to R3 because the overlay district is already in place here. Is that something that you would encourage us to do? I mean, or it really depends on whether you want to see a higher density housing right next to downtown. We talk about West Bay Center redeveloping and right. trying to get um, just more energy and activity downtown. And so I think the reason that that is R4, and, and I'll, zone in the, I'll zoom in on the zoning map. Um, so this is, uh, hmm. I was under the impression this was R4. Maybe it's the next block down. Yeah, there it is. Okay. The R4 and the R3 colors do not stand out very well on the map here. Um, so this particular block, and I think, um, well, it's really, it's really just this first block here. It's just this block that went R4 because we wanted to encourage some high density housing close to downtown to bring people that can walk down there and support businesses and kind of create that synergy. Once, you, once you're away from this single block, it goes back to R3. So we're really talking about rezoning one block. And if, it, if we wanted to go R3, we can go R3. Um, this is one of the few areas in the city where we've actually applied the R4 density, which is exclusively multifamily housing. Um, I don't think we have uh, very many R3 areas. So my question with that is, and, and there's not an answer to it, is what are the unintended consequences down the road by, for lack of better words, piecemealing uh, changes to our code? Well, I, I don't know that it's piecemealing. I think that um, it's, it, you're, you're going block by block. It, it avoids the spot zone issue if you deal with it um, as, as an entire block. The, the height overlay district means that whether it's R3 or R4, if somebody chooses to build an apartment building on one of these lots, the height limit is gonna be the same, whether it's R3 or R4. It's just that they're allowed to do things other than apartments going forward. They said, if we're trying to drive higher levels of activity in that area, that's the purpose of that zoning. If we want to see more single family homes there, that's likely what we'll see if we change the zoning. Yeah, I, I think you're unlikely to see change at all here if you go R3 because everything will become conforming and these houses are probably too expensive to tear down. Um, as it is, I, I don't know. I, I think you're unlikely to see a whole lot of change on this block anyway, right now. I think um, I think there's too many easy to develop sites in the city that are preventing some of the more expensive sites from developing. Scott, you wanna weigh in? Well, I, you know, I'm circling back to the issue where this person wanted to expand their house. And for me, it seemed like a reasonable request because, um, Right now, as everybody knows, we're in a housing crisis. And so people are trying to be creative about how they can um, add more room to their house for their kids or for their parents quite often. Um, and so I was really looking for a solution to help out in that specific and isolated instance. The recommendation that we've heard and backed up by the attorney's opinion is that's not good planning. Um, but I also we'll circle back to, we got to be a little more flexible than we've been in the past because we're in a different housing market than we've, we've ever seen. What did we decide on the 10%? The, we're discussing the, the, go ahead. Whoever was that you, Nick? The recommendation was not to do that. Right. It was right. zoning changes. And instead to, to um, pursue zoning. Correct. Yeah. 
is the but, uh, is the Ford dealership is that uh, the same as um, the hotel next door? The Heights. Um, um, let me. Look. The reason why I ask is because um, I know they've talked about possibly moving, um, and I was wondering if that would be something. Yeah, let me go back to my map there. here. Three stories on the water there. Three stories on the water. I think mm -hmm. so. Oh, next. Okay. Same exactly. as the West Bay Shopping Center would be. Yeah. Yeah. The the water side of Bay Street is all three stories except for four two nine Bay Street, which is uh, over by DeKalb Pier. Um, only the uphill portions of Bay Street get either a four or a five story height. I'll I'll share the map again. Here you go. So down by the water, you're gonna only be three stories. When you get right. tucked into the hillside. Which you're where you're not going to impact views to the same level, right? Okay, yeah, yeah. The idea is to create views so that if you have a fourth story on the uphill side, they're able to see over this building to the water still. Following you, yeah. And then in in along Bethel, we went five stories solely because you're kind of in a canyon coming yeah. up the hill, and you're mm -hmm. not going to block anybody's view there. For sure. So basically, when I, I'm not putting you on the spot, Nick, what I'm hearing you say, if we choose to go from R R four to R three, the impact is minimal in this block. It it really is because you can still develop apartments if you want to, um, but right now the way this is written is that if you want to redevelop, you have to build apartments, and that's that's the distinction. But because of the view protection overlay, the height limit you're not actually getting extra height out of the R4 zone. What you're getting is exclusively multifamily housing. So by doing that, then that would allow the jump, the family to uh, make the change to their household. Correct. Because it'd be an allowed use. I don't have an issue then if we're going to do the block and the impact is minimal. But it, it seems to offer some consistency as you move easterly as well with the adjacent zoning. So this is something we need to bring to council, correct? Well, I, I think that if, if a council member wanted to sponsor this application um, or if the committee wanted to recommend that staff file the application, you would need to direct us to do that. And um, we can, you know, Jim and I can... Uh, we'll probably have either Connor or Sean put together an application to make the change. And then in Jan at the end of January, we will bring the all of the applications that we receive forward to the council. And then you have to adopt the roster of amendments for 2025. And then we'll process them and take them to the planning commission. And when would the person be able to probably make this change to their household? Uh, at the earliest July of 2025 and at the latest uh, November of December of 2025. Okay. Takes a little while. It does. It'll take, it'll, it'll take that long for the permits sometimes, you know? Yeah. I mean, He's in the city, not the county. That's, that's true. <laughs> I'm trying to dig on Scott a little bit. That's true. <laughs> not Sorry. my division. Not my division. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, let's uh, let's at least move forward. That is, is my recommendation, you guys. Two, two gentlemen in agreement? Yeah, I agree. Yes. Yeah, I think we'll see this very issue pop up again in the future and, and we can have another discussion about it. Well, I think that's okay as long as we do, you know, do it uh in consistently uh with the with the uh our legal uh advice. Yeah. Okay, number three. All right. Easy. So Dennis and I have been meeting with PSE. They have, um, I, I think as part of the infrastructure law, there was a lot of federal money for EV charging infrastructure that came to PSE. Um, they, are, they have a program where they are looking to install pole-mounted EV chargers that can serve an on-street parking stall within the city. Uh -huh. So um, they got together with the city and said, hey, are you interested in this? And if so, do you have any idea where this might work? Um, and we said, yeah, let us, you know, we looked at our Google Street View and went and found um, areas where this is possible. And the the challenge with providing EV charging on the street is that the power pole has to be located in the landscape strip between a sidewalk and the curb. 
we don't have a lot of those poles in Port Orchard. And so this map kind of shows the areas where we both have on-street parking with power poles in a landscape strip where the cord isn't gonna lay over the sidewalk while somebody is charging their car. And um, a few of these are pretty far out and are probably not, not viable. Um, there's we, we have some on-street parking on Melcher. We have some on-street parking on Hull. Um, we did identify a, a space up at Givens Park uh, one in front of the new building that we purchased at 730 Kitsap. There's one right outside of our DCD um, planning office on uh, at the corner of Klein and Kitsap. And then there's there's an opportunity up by Central Park. And um, we wanted to take this to the Land Use Committee just to say, number one, um, are you interested in pursuing this program? It's all taken care of by PSE and paid for by PSE. And it would be a, a program where somebody pulls up to the charger and PSE has hired a, a vendor who provides this. In Tacoma, there's a company called Flow and you can go on their app and find EV chargers all over the country where you can pull over and it's a it's a level two charger. So it takes, you know, eight hours to charge your car, but um, it, it's available to you. I actually, um, we have an EV uh, and I was up in Canada in March and on a snowboarding trip. And that's, uh, that's the vendor that I used um, when we drove up there because there wasn't another option. So um, anyway, PSE is going to hire the vendor and they wanted us to identify some options. They want to do a public process to make sure that they're meeting targets for um, underserved communities and making sure that they're getting input from the public on where the public thinks these ought to go. Uh, and um, these are the options that we came up with. And we included street view imagery of each of these polls. Um, we, we don't have an updated street view image for, for Melcher, but this is the new housing Kitsap project that went in. And you can see the shadow from the power pole here with the on-street parking. Um, on Hull, there's a parking lane with several poles going up the street. There's a pole here at Central Park. This is the one at Givens Park, which could potentially do uh, two EV stalls off of, off of a single pole. And then there's uh, on the hill right near City Hall and close to downtown, there's one or two spaces that could be served by a pole. And this one in front of 730 Kitsap, you know, we had striped this as an, an ADA stall, but it's, um, and there's an old driveway here that doesn't lead to a, a working garage. So we we were thinking that this space could be moved uh, up to the parking lot rather than being on the street. Um, and, and I think this building is kind of out of service here, but um, if we make a public space available at the 730 building, this could become an EV space on the street here as well. And so we wanted to hear from the land use committee. Number one, are you do you want us to pursue this further? And if so, um, I believe uh, PSE is probably going to have us post some uh, public outreach on our Facebook page, and they're going to solicit input um, in the coming weeks. Go ahead, Scott. So, Nick, remind me of the goal of of this uh, program. I mean, let me let me give you context. It seems like a great idea for certain commercial areas. But then where you see Hull Street, for example, um, it's got a series of poles that make it available. Is this also to help residential uh, or residents with parking out front of their house? Yeah, it is. And and um, one of the issues that we see is that older apartment complexes, um, it's hard to retrofit in EV charging infrastructure because you're running power underground mm -hmm. or overhead. Um, and new buildings have to provide EV charging infrastructure, but it's really... You know, I, I think we talked about this last night with the vehicle purchases that we made, but, um, you know, it it costs about an eighth of the cost of a tank of gas to charge a car at home. And so people who live in an older apartment complex without EV infrastructure don't even have the choice to get an EV unless they always charge at a high speed charger somewhere far away from their house. So they are looking to get these into neighborhoods. Our challenge is that we don't have all of our apartment complexes are in areas of the city with no landscape strip along a sidewalk where you can actually do this, or there's no on-street parking. So our our options are pretty limited to a few areas of the city where there isn't much multifamily housing currently, um, or um, in the older part of town above downtown where, um, you know, I think there's the both the county campus and downtown mean that somebody might come here and be looking to charge. And there may be residents who live downtown also who might choose to use those options. So on Hull Street, for example, where you've got a lot of cars that park there that are primarily gas gasoline vehicles, how would you manage the parking limitations there? Um, you would probably have to sign it for four hours and we would put it in our code that it's a four hour parking time zone and my parking enforcement officer would go by and chalk the tire and uh, 
And if somebody parked there who wasn't supposed to, they'd get a ticket for, for not being an EV. Hey, but Nick, I'm wrong. Earlier, but earlier you said it would take eight hours, for example. Um, so is that... Well, it's eight hours if it's peak? empty to a full charge. But if, full I mean, charge, most yeah. people, you know, I, I, when I get home at night, I charge for three hours and my car's full. Yeah. Mayor has it. Go ahead, Mayor. I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but when you and I talked about this, PSCs, we're supposed to provide PSC with a number of potential sites. I think they're only going to cite two of these. Yeah, exactly. They're they're trying to identify two look up to two locations where they can do this, and they want to figure out from public input which ones would be the best uh, in the eyes of the public. Okay. And then they'll have their vendor install these, and then it'll be you can find it on an app, and people who are coming to Port Orchard can can come use it. Residents can also use it anytime they need to. Well, in that context, then I think citing it close to downtown makes sense. Also would generate some business downtown, perhaps while people are charging. I, I think the map is just showing potential sites, not yeah, yeah. where they'd all go. Um, just a side note, this answers my question about why there were no sites west of 16, but you've answered that quite easily. Um, I, I'm fully in favor of this, the more the better. Uh, when we were in Manson, uh, outside of Chelan, that's exactly what you pointed out, Nick. Uh, my son-in-law, uh, he pulled up the app, found out where a charging station was. Interestingly enough, him and my daughter went out to eat while the car was charging. Mm -hmm. Eric, any comments? Uh, Scott asked it. It was about the um, parking enforcement. How are we going to... Um, the limitations on how the duration of parking, but yes, Scott asked it and answered. Yeah. Cool. So I think the next step is that, and, and I don't know whether the contract happens before the public outreach or after, but I believe that PSE will, will have the contract agree to allow for an EV only parking space. Um, and then they will agree to, to select a vendor and have the infrastructure installed. And it's a period of time where we're going to allow this to be an EV parking space uh, in exchange for their investment uh, on the poll. So, um, so yeah, if, if land use committee is good with this, I think maybe we should report on it at the next council meeting. And, um, and I will let PSE know that uh, there's support for, for picking one or two sites and go from there. Thumbs up here. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I got another commitment here. I, I got to get to. Thanks, Mayor. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay. The last one was just uh, asking, uh, before we go for good of the order, just asking a real uh, quick update or more of an expansion of what uh, Nick was talking about last night with uh, countywide uh, ADU uh, planning uh, initiative. I think that's the best way to say it. Yeah, so um, I, I'll, so first of all, the KRCC agreed we had some extra budget left over because everybody's been busy with comp plan and a whole lot of meetings got canceled. And so um, KRCC has money in their account that are our, our annual dues that come in. And the, um, the board was interested in trying to encourage affordable housing and what can we do to do that. Um, they decided that they wanted us to pursue a pre-approved ADU program. And so the um, pre-approved ADUs, basically we would have an architect design a handful of ADU plans that would be available to anybody in the county to use free of charge. So we would pay the architect, we would have all of the building officials in the county review them, and um, there would probably be a cover sheet that is specific to each jurisdiction that the applicant would need to fill out, but then uh, all of the, the individual plan sheets would be um, would be stamped approved already by uh, by the the various jurisdictions um the the uh, user of the plan would have to sign a waiver you know saying that they're not going to sue the architect if their contractor gets into a dispute with them about uh uh constructability or or construction challenges that emerge from the use of the plans the city is also going to need a waiver uh, saying that we're not going to get sued for providing these plans, but basically provided somebody is willing to provide those forms, they could just come in and pay the plan, uh, the permit fee without doing plan review and go and build this on their site. Uh, they would have to provide a site plan showing where on their property it's going to go and make sure that it meets the lot coverage requirements, et cetera. Um, but really streamline this process so that you don't have to spend a lot of time trying to go through the ADU permitting. Um, the RFP or the RFQ that we issued 
Um, it, it called for the creation of up to eight plans and we specified different sizes. There was one of, at least one of them has to be an accessible unit so that if somebody wanted to build a unit for somebody in a wheelchair, um, it would be wheelchair accessible. Um, there were some units that were carriage houses where it's either a three car or a two car garage with an apartment above it. And so that would be somebody who has a bigger lot or has an alley that they want to build an ADU behind their house could use. And then um, there were four or five that were um, either a 400 square foot unit, a 600 square foot, an 800 square foot, and a 1,000 square foot unit that would give people a menu of options to choose. And um, yeah, the hope is, and, and then the other stipulation was that the whoever we pick would agree to do a one-time uh refresh of the plans next time the building codes change so that we get at least five or six years of use out of the plans. And so um, we interviewed the first consultant yesterday. The other three interviews are tomorrow. And um, the committee is uh, made up of uh, our, our KSR, KS, KRCC reps are on there, um, Sophie and Pauline, and then each of the directors from the various jurisdictions or a, a designee are on there. And then we wanted to have one elected official from KRCC participate. And so um, we had asked Jay uh, to, to fill that role. And so he's our, our, um, our token uh, elected official on the <laughs> selection committee to uh, report back to everyone and uh, tell you uh, that everything's being done correctly. And uh, and actually, he provided some really good questions in our first meeting yesterday. You uh, you asked, you you used words that I hadn't even heard before uh, concerning construction, and I was impressed. So I think this is really a good deal uh, for us, and I think one of the um, one of the folks that uh, companies that is uh, we're interviewing has this with uh, going on with Pierce already. Don't isn't that correct? Uh, Nick? Uh, so yeah, the um, it, it's actually Thurston County has this program. That's Seattle good. and Kirkland partnered on a program where the plans are interchangeable in Seattle and Kirkland. And um, I think Whatcom County is now doing this. So it, it's been done in several jurisdictions. Um, the Seattle and Kirkland program, I think, is the most successful in terms of repeat usage of, of plans, uh, from what I understand. But um, I think a big component of this is also how well we market this and get the information out to the community. And so one of the things we heard um, from our, our first interview was was just that the marketing aspect of this and having a website where people can go uh, to one place to find out about this countywide program and, and making sure they understand it. And it's um, and that we're also educating people about it through social media. But um, yeah, I and I can tell you from my experience, I live in Tacoma and uh my wife and I were looking at doing a project like this and, uh, you know, architectural plans were going to cost $15,000 to do a custom ADU plan. And, um, if the city had had something that worked for us off the shelf, that would have, uh, made it a whole lot easier for us to move forward with a project. Is there, um, uh, is ADUs, is there a sewer connection fee if you are not going off the lateral? So our current policy in Port Orchard is that if you're served off of the 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 so, um the side sewer for the main house, and if you mm -hmm. only have one meter for both properties, there's no connection fees. If you want a separate meter and a separate connection and a separate bill, um, it it really has to do with the water meter kind of driving things. If you want a separate u a utility account, then you have to pay the connection fee. But you could, sh but sewer wise, you could share the same lateral though. You would. Oh, well, whatever if, happens if, if it was possible whatever happens for water also happens for sewer so oh, if you, oh, so okay. the two go hand in hand okay. um we've talked about that and you know one of the things that's um you know i i think somewhat hard for people to to swallow in port orchard is that we have one rate for multifamily and single family so if you want to build a house or an apartment you pay the same amount per unit versus recognizing that a smaller efficiency unit might use less water and have less sewage. And so I think next time we update our plans, we've, we've talked about whether we ought to consider having, a, you know, maybe an ADU does pay a connection fee, but it's like half of the rate of the main house. Yeah. Um, we just don't have that framework right now. And it seemed like if somebody wanted to build a house that they might have a family member living in, as opposed to renting it out to a, a separate couple or, you know, a family, um, you don't always know whether they're truly a, a separate connection versus just being an additional room kind of added to the house. I think the other thing that's that I've always struggled with is that a six bedroom house that has, you know, 14 kids, 
and a three bedroom house are paying the same amount despite having vastly different usage. They pay the same upfront connection fee to connect to the system. And so, um, you know, there's, it, it's always difficult to come up with systems that are easy to administer, but also equitable. It's one of the questions we get all the time. <laughs> Anything else for the good of the order? Scott? Yeah, hey, Nick, <clears throat> real quick, like I saw that on the surplus was the DJI uh, uh, drone. And um, I recall some years ago, you had shown footage of a um, development engineering site inspection, I believe, um, for a, a proposed subdivision. And you said that it was it was quite valuable and that it, is, it would it was a 20 minute flyover versus up to a couple hours walking around or maybe a half day. I can't remember. Um, are we ceasing use of, of drones for that purpose? That's the first I've heard of it. So I, I was not aware of that. I don't know if it's been replaced. Okay. Uh, are, are we still using a question them? for public works? That was uh, public works who flies the drone. Yeah. Do you know if we're still using drones at all? You said for code enforcement? No, it was, it was for site inspections. Oh, like site erosion inspection. control inspection. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we are because we, I thought we got footage of the Marina lift station. We did. Now. Yeah. Oh, we we still have, now. yeah, we're still using drones. Yeah. yeah, I think we are. I, I think okay. maybe we either got a new one or or who knows what. Okay. Maybe right. you know how that technology evolves there. So I'll tell you, my, my code enforcement training, man, that's a sticky subject right there. Yeah, right. I mean, it was, yeah. Right. Anything else for the good of the order? No, Thank have you a good all. evening. Good, me good meeting. Keep Thank you. Forward. Thanks. All right. See y'all.